All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to our July Happiness Hour, our members only event that we kick off every month with where we talk to one of the incredible thought leaders that we are friends with in this community. Uh, this month, we have the pleasure, the absolute, I don't know, honor of talking to Mary Liz Bender, who has been such a longtime friend of ever widening circles and the conspiracy of goodness. Um, she is one of those people who, whenever we talk about um, people that have benefited from the conspiracy of goodness, people who are such an emblem of what it means to be a part of community and people who truly are doing, who are doers out there in the world. Um, I can't think of anybody better than Mary Liz to, 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 to talk about. Um, she is a musician. She is a forward thinker. She is an empathy uh, polymath. She is the kind of person who, when you talk to them, it makes you feel like your day is just, well, skyrocketing. Um, <laughs> she is also an incredible uh, rocket launch photographer and um, space explorer. I guess she's also a Mars explorer now, and we'll have her talk a little bit more about that. Um, but Mary Liz is one of those people who I think embodies what it means to see the world in complex terms and then use that complexity to see more beauty and wonder and awe all around us. So so thank you so much, Mary Liz, for joining us this evening. Um, I'm really excited for our conversation and for you to tell us more about the work that you do and um, give us an introduction to your your view of the world, which I think is absolutely astounding. Thank you. That was a pretty emotional description of me. So thank you for <laughs> everything that you just said. Um, yeah, I I was just thinking about how I think we say, I say this to you all every time we talk, but the article that I posted on Ever Widening Circles was actually the launch pad for my entire career as a rocket launch um, photographer, but also as someone who has been kind of evangelizing for the overview effect, the planetary perspective. Um, if it wasn't for that, I don't know exactly where I would be. It was the thing that put me on the radar for um, the folks that are now working with me every single day. Uh, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. I, I like to remember that. Um, so yes, I have benefited greatly from this amazing community and pretty much everything you all do. Well, thank you. So I'm Mary Liz, I wanted to open it up. I think we use some terms there, you know, um, overview effect and, mm -hmm. you know, planetary perspective you give us a little idea, like a more, I don't know, not more concrete, but an idea of what, what those two phrases mean. And I know that they're central to your work. Yes. So uh, first I'll just kind of explain what, uh, how I stumbled upon this. So um, a few years ago, this was not so long ago, in 2016, I was a touring musician. I was a full-time programmer and a touring musician. Um, and I've always been a very, very curious person, always very much in search of what is my purpose? It's almost like it's been almost like a plague until I discovered this. It's like every morning I would wake up and say, I know that there is something that I'm supposed to be doing and it's more than what I'm doing right now. Um, and it wasn't until I discovered the overview effect that it just, it hit me and I devoted my entire life to this. So um, I happened to be on tour and every night I was playing shows to thousands of people, which was a dream come true. But I remember one night specifically looking out at the crowd and they were just like, they had a hunger in their eyes. You know, you ever look at a crowd that you're around when you're at like a fantastic music festival or show and you just kind of look around and see the wonder in people's eyes. <laughs> I mean, I was gifted that. I have chills. I was gifted that every night. Like they were looking up at the stage and I saw the wonder in all of their eyes and like this this hunger for an experience. Um, mm. And I felt that I wasn't giving them the full, the, everything that I had in me. And I felt like, I, I felt a responsibility, I suppose, to give them more. And it was um, just a few days after that, I remember discovering this incredible movie, this short film called Overview, which I hope we can share with folks. Um, that changed my life. 
and I rewatch it pretty often. I just rewatched it yesterday. And because it really reminds me the power of art, the power of storytelling, the power of music, the power of visual, you know, visual art um, to communicate a feeling, to transfer mm -hmm. knowledge through experience, which is really um, what the overview effect is all about. So what is it? Um, I watched that little film and I was astounded to learn that not only I didn't realize that we'd been sending humans to space uh, for many, many, many years. Um, continuously for 20 years, there has not been one single day that a human has not been orbiting mm. 220, 240 miles above our heads. Um, so I didn't, first of all, I was astounded about that. Um, second of all, there was this beautiful man who appeared on screen with this warm personality and he was a, a historian and a philosopher and he was trying to translate for us what the astronauts were experiencing and you can tell the astronauts are like kind of fumbling their way through describing like it changed me um going to space i had spent years and years and years training really hard i mean they you know you talk about being busy these people are so busy nasa um, and the other space agencies are very strict with their schedules because they're very costly to the taxpayer. So they have to be doing things that produce good science and engineering. And um, they don't give them any time to pause and reflect and very little time to look out the window. That is starting to change a little because NASA has finally recognized that there is a phenomenon taking place when they're given the time to look out the window. So this film... Uh, began to describe that phenomenon. And actually, I will just um, pull up this quote by Frank, um, and I'll just read it to you. Um, yeah, I think I might share my screen in a bit, but I'm just going to read this. He said, when we look at our planet from the perspective of the surface, we see diversity, we see chaos. And in, in this way, we'll, we'll kind of talk about diversity and unity. But what, he, what he's saying is, we look at the planet from the surface, we see chaos. When astronauts look at it from orbit or the moon, they see unity. It's the same planet seen, seen from a different perspective. And there are, there are some official definitions of the overview effect, but the point is, astronauts go to space, cosmonauts go to space, they look back at our planet and repeatedly, time and time again, they are instantly changed. They see the beauty, the extreme beauty of our planet. They um, enter a state of awe, which is really a state of shock, which can turn to terror or it can turn to wonder. But because it's such beauty, it turns to wonder. And when you're in a state of wonder, you're, you're present, you're ever present. You, you begin to recognize the reality of your experience because your senses are heightened you're completely aware of what's going on so these astronauts are floating looking at our planet they're seeing the most intense colors that they've never seen before because they're outside of our atmosphere and nothing is dulled down everything is so vibrant reflecting the sun's light you know back at them and they they enter this state of shock where they realize oh my god we live on a planet which is such a they, they come back and they're like why isn't this terribly obvious to all of us why does it take me going to space to recognize that we live on a closed tiny fragile system and we are one of so many trillions of planets that are all orbiting. Almost every star has planets orbiting it. And there are trillions of stars that we know of. <laughs> and so they come back with this new perspective that vastly changes who they are. My, my favorite line uh, that I think I first, maybe first wrote when I was uh, writing that article with you all is that artists go to space as scientists, engineers, and fighter pilots. And they return artists and humanitarians desperate to share their new perspective. And so Frank White um, in 1987 was on a flight from, I think it was, yeah, it was DC, 
political city, right? He was going from D.C. to Vegas during a political time. And he kind of watched all of the, the, the politics disappear as he rose up and into the atmosphere. And he'd been studying space. And so he just thought to himself, oh, my gosh, I wonder what it would be like to live on Mars and always see our planet at a, at a, at a distance. You would always kind of have this overview of you know all of humanity all all of the earthlings are just there together on this tiny blue ball floating in the vastness of space and he hypothesized that um astronauts probably have a really meaningful perspective that we should share and so he started interviewing astronauts starting in 87 uh the apollo astronauts that he spoke to had the most profound things to say because they went all the way to the moon the Earth wasn't the main thing in their view, like the astronauts of today. They went all the way to the moon. They could take their thumb and blot out the Earth. I mean, and so all of human history, all of music, all of poetry, all of the wars, all of everything, they could just blot it out with their thumb. And that profoundly changed them. And so uh, when he began to interview these people, they were emotional. They were like, oh my God, you've put a name to the thing that happened to me and it's helping me. Like you're giving me language to describe my experience. And so when I watched that film overview and it's full length planetary, which is a gorgeous, um, just I would say that there's probably no better environmental um, movie out there than planetary because it gives you the same kind of perspective that the Earthrise image did. I mean, I don't know how much, how familiar you all are with the Earthrise image, but um, that image was taken in the 60s during the Apollo era. And two years after the image of our Earth was taken by another human, uh, our Earth movement, began our entire environmental environmental movement this new planetary perspective came into consciousness and so um that film did it for me and i realized oh my god this is giving me the language to talk about our interconnectedness about how every action does affect everyone inside this system and every in inaction does affect everyone inside the system i mean it's just it's a zoom out it's an overview effect and so i realized this is what i wanted to gift to people um and then yeah I, I i completely changed my whole life course i sold my home i got into a camper i didn't know what i was doing i just knew i have to do something with this so i set out on the road and I just started interviewing astronauts myself because I really wanted to make sure this was real. You know, I really wanted and I, I wanted to find out if there was a way as an artist where I could maybe translate through another means, you know, through music. I mean, because music is so powerful. So I just thought oh, if I could just get them to transfer their knowledge and then me transfer that out in a new way. And so that's what I dedicated the last several years of my life to. And along the way, I surprised myself. Um, I found other forms of awe and wonder that completely transformed me. While speaking to the astronauts, I learned so many lessons that just drastically shifted my perspective on my, my little life. And so I began to share that uh, with people. And so, yeah, it's been an incredible journey and what's so insane is that i was just earlier today um speaking to frank white the author of that book that that inspired the film that changed my life i am great friends with the director of the film now and we're all collaborating on these efforts to to share this perspective with people i'm friends with all the astronauts now it's it's like the weirdest thing to look back to 2016 when I was on stage and I thought I had fulfilled my greatest dreams but I was like no there's something more <laughs> I know I'll sell my house and go out there and see what I can do and then just you know a few years later it's like oh yeah I'm working with global leaders to share their the perspective of the astronauts with the world it's so mind-blowing that's so incredible. And, you know, one of the things that we're really trying to move towards, because I think what we see with so many thought leaders like yourself 
is this idea of wanting people to live with purpose, right? And I think mm -hmm. having those moments like you described of, of, you know, I think we can reach our levels of skill and our levels of, you know, where we, it's what we always dreamed of, standing in front on stage in front of people, you know, uh, running the most successful business, whatever it is, whatever that goal is. And yet we feel this, this, there's a disconnect there, I think, between who we are and then what we wanted to be and then our purpose. And I'm wondering, you know, as we talk about the overview effect and we talk about how you stumbled upon and how we, you came to, to finding your purpose, I mean, was it following your curiosity? What do you think is the thing that really helps people find their purpose in, in all of this? Because it, it is so difficult, I think, to do that. Yeah. And, and for me, uh, there were so many barriers along the way that it's almost like it would take too long to describe, but it's like everybody else, you know, the more that I speak about this stuff and the more that I share my story, I hear people say like, wow, I couldn't, I would never imagine I could have reached out to someone like that. And, you know, um, so what I realize is that there is a curiosity that drives us, all of us. It's so deep. It's intrinsic. It's what makes us human. <laughs> I mean, that's why we are intrinsically explorers. Um, it's why we make art. We're, we're so drawn to the unknown. Um, mm. But what I've recognized is that um, whether it's through trauma, whether it's through personality difference, um, it, there are seemingly these barriers and and it's very scary the unknown and there's very risky the unknown and I do happen to be someone who has always been willing to take risks and I've always had this extreme uh curious pull for better or for worse it's always just pulled me forward um but I still have had to really work to overcome a lot of fear and I've always had issues with in the past with confidence like who am i to be trying to do something so important i i feel that even today um i'm working currently on a documentary about art in space but of course it can't just be about the art that's been done in space it's got to be about like what's art and how does it you know make us human and and i have to make this profound and i, I was having all these epiphanies like oh my gosh how can i tell people that art is not decoration it's exploration and then i thought who am i to be telling anybody about any of this stuff and what you have to do is just hear that little voice and then say all right I've given her a name. Her name's Bertha. I'm like, all right, Bertha, sit down. Let's talk about this. All right, so you're judging me. I understand. Um, what's what's the issue here? Well, you know, and then I, I kind of have a little conversation with myself, and um, I talk through any fears that I have about what I'm trying to do, and then I say, yeah, but this is what you're supposed to be doing. No one else is going to be doing this. This is like the weirdest thing ever. So whatever it is that you feel extremely compelled to do, I think is what you're really supposed to do. I, I mean, mm. I think a lot about Joseph Campbell's follow your bliss statement. I think that's, that's it. That's like the key to a purpose-filled life. What is tugging at you? day after day what is it that you continue to avoid day after day maybe look there first because mm. i have a feeling that you're just too scared to assume the responsibility that's where i was at and so um yeah you at some point have to make friends with the fear and the the self-judgment and move beyond that um and i'm so grateful that i did i I always call it my Indiana Jones moment. Every time I get a new idea, I'm like, oh, God, here we go again. All right, we're going to step off off of this ledge onto the invisible one and see what happens. And it's always the right idea. You know, it's that leap yeah. of faith. So I love that. I love that. And I'm, I'm sure that's probably something that you see over and over again. The astronauts that you talk to, they have to have that drive, that follow your bliss, that 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 drive to to why else would you strap yourself into a rocket and put yourself into space exactly and that, that's what they say all the time they repeat i hear that repeatedly um so 
Mike Fossum, an astronaut that just recently came here to this town to talk to the students of, uh, of the Brownsville area in Texas. He's from here, and it was so cool to see him speaking to everyone um, about his journey from this little town. I mean, it's a pretty poor area, and and there was no infrastructure for like learning about engineering and science and all of that. And so he kind of paved his own way. And I loved what he said. He said, you know, I'm not telling anybody to be an astronaut or scientist or an engineer or, or an artist or whatever. I'm telling you to just follow your dreams because that's what I did. And mm -hmm. what you'll recognize is that if you have this idea about the end goal, like, oh, I just want to be a rock star, you know, and then you realize how grueling it is along the way. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I want to, I just want to be an astronaut. I want to go to space. Well, you're going to have to really, really just very deeply actually want that in your life because the road is very difficult on the way there. So he talks about like, you, you'll have to pick something that, um, that you'll enjoy doing day in and day out without thinking only about the end goal. And um, I loved that. That hit me in a specific way. But again, I said, you have to pick something, but I really think the, the thing picks you somehow. Mm -hmm. Like everybody has their own unique set of talents and skills and passion. And that combines to make you uniquely the best to do the thing that you're here to do. So. Yeah, listening. I think listening to yourself is the the way to find the map. And it's like never ending. I mean, every day I question, am I doing enough? Am I, you know, it's it's never, it's almost never enough, which is uh, an interesting balance that I'm always trying to find. Yeah, and it seems to me too that you are a very opportunity-driven person. I want to, at the top we mentioned, you know, that you went to Mars. And I, <laughs> and I think that one of the things I admire a lot about you as a doer in this world and the conspiracy of goodness is you seem to grab, hold on to and explore opportunities. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit of that in, in the case of, of your trip to Mars, but um, that's something that I admire deeply about you as, as, a, as somebody who is living a very purpose-driven life. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'd actually love to share my screen yeah, in the please. show if that's okay. Yeah, I've All got right. it open here or ready for you to share. That's, that's what Thank I mean. you. All right. Let me know if you can see my screen here. Indeed, indeed. So <clears throat> back in 2016, when I discovered how profound the human experience of spaceflight was, I thought, oh, well, you know, I had, I had worked as a... Um, a user experience designer for many, many years. And like the one thing that is important uh, when you're trying to design something for someone else, anything at all, is that you have to immerse yourself in the shoes of the user, that person that you're designing for. And I set out with this kind of vague idea, like I wanna understand the experience and then I wanna help design an experience for space travelers so that we can really help them, you know, integrate what they learn and use that language that helps them translate better or create time for them to pause, you know, and, and actually meditate on what they're thinking about while they're in space. So that's actually the journey that I'm on right now. I'm working with astronauts and different organizations to do that. And so I thought to myself, well, I should understand what it's like to be an astronaut. Um, I mean, plus, you know, I'd love to go to space. I mean, that's that's the real deal. I want to go there and experience this for myself and then come back and, you know, um, it would be a lot easier for me to share if I did. So um, I have been signing up for absolutely anything related to astronaut training. Um, and I'm excited about some new developments in that area, which I'll share soon, but not today. Uh, so the first thing I did is I went to Mars <laughs> because why wouldn't you? Um, I'm really also intrigued by this whole idea of space exploration, not just as a method of reflection, just like art. It's not just for reflection. It's also for looking forward. And when I say forward, um, I just mean how can we expand our horizon internally and it's so easy to do that literally like when you think about 
what it will be like to build communities on another world, you think about everything from scratch. And that can inform what we do right here, right now. So um, I really wanted to think about what is it going to be like when we start from scratch, we live in these tiny little habitats on this world with with not a lot of nature and we're in small, you know, isolated environments with our crewmates, small quarters. And so uh, I decided to go on a journey to uh, Hawaii, which at the top of volcano Mauna Loa or on the side of Mauna Loa is this 1200 square foot little habitat right there. It's called High Seas, um, and that's Mauna Kea, the famous, uh, the mountain that you kind of see on the top left with the snow on top. So this is not like the Hawaii that you think of. It is on the big island. So if we went all the way down, 8,500 feet down the mountain, yes, it would be tropical. But up here, it is not. As you can tell, there is very little life, um, very thin atmosphere. And so that alone was really interesting uh, on the body physiologically. My meditations were really interesting. Um, but there we are on this volcano fissure. And the reason that they put this habitat here was originally for uh, NASA research. So not only psychological research for, for astronauts who they plan to send to Mars, but also um, astrobiology research. So there are lava tubes all over Mars. And there is a prediction that maybe there are small life forms inside those lava tubes that we could study. We don't know that. But if we're going to look somewhere, that's probably where to look. And this place is full of lava tubes with ha which have these biochemical life forms. And so I got to go there with my five crewmates and study these life forms and also just study what it was like to live uh, in confined quarters with these people. Um, that's it. That's the space. It's, again, 1,200 square feet. We each had a tiny little crew quarter and our own workspace, and that's the communal era area that you see with the table. Uh, that's my crew quarters. I, I'm only five feet tall, so I fit in great, but my six foot tall friend uh, to the right of me was not comfortable, and I kept hearing her hit her head on the wall. <laughs> that was like our only view out the window, okay? So I'm thinking, all right. NASA's not allowed to design any habitat ever again <laughs> because this is not okay. Um, you, humans need to be able to see outside. It's just ridiculous. Now, these, as you know, are my music gloves. These are the same music gloves that Imogen Heap uh, created. And so I took them as a way to test, like, all right, how, how am I going to connect with myself with others. I did some Earth-based musical collaborations where I would send a musical file to a friend on Earth. I'd have to wait almost an entire day to get a response from her, and then I'd add on to those tracks. Um, so I was there kind of experimenting with how art, you know, would help us connect with ourselves and also humans back on the planet Earth, which we'll definitely want to do. Um, was trying to see, like, how does VR help us connect? So I was definitely immersing myself in like nature, rainforest environments, anything that reminded me of the biological system, you know, I was meant, my body is meant for a lot of meditation, um, a lot of exercise, group exercise was everything for us. I mean, that was like our main bonding moment. And it was, it was just so fun games. Like what I recognized was that it was all about the little things. It was all about the really simple human things and ensuring that we remained open with each other and communicative and playful. And these are things that astronauts are not encouraged to do, right? It, they really are not. They do it. Um, but Im imagine if we were to send people to space <laughs> with the intention of making it like making it about the human experience why else would we do human spaceflight it makes no sense to me so um that was my journey and it was incredible and i realized oh my gosh i am definitely an explorer like sticking this spacesuit on and this oxygen pack and going out to lava tubes um and like i mean trekking through miles of fields of lava fields <laughs> was the most fun I think I've ever had in my life. So this is us. We'd climb down into this lava tube and all the white there is th those life forms that we were studying. Um, 
we think they feed off of the sulfur or something. I actually, uh, I had a time capsule made where I decided, you know, it's so important to me that we set intentions for the way that we do anything, right? All, all of my work, everything is around conscious exploration, whether that is consciously moving through my daily life or consciously moving through the solar system and building communities on other worlds. And so um, one thing that's important to realize that maybe nobody like outside of this tiny little space bubble realizes is that this is the decade in which we will leap permanently off the planet, like no matter what, it's happening. And so that's why I like getting people excited so that they can come be a part of it and then help us consciously move forward through that endeavor. And so I gathered a bunch, a bunch of um, little like intentions from a lot of different friends from all these different little industry, you know, areas of life. So musicians and poets and philosophers and astronauts, and they're all in here. And uh, I deposited this uh, time capsule um, in the lava tube thinking, I hope future humans find this and then realize, oh my gosh, this is what those humans were thinking about and what they were hoping for when they left off the planet. And how did that turn out? <laughs> like maybe we'll help them learn something about their own future. Um, but yeah, that that was my journey to high seas and I learned quite a lot about it. And um, yeah, I'll have more to share about that pretty soon, but it was profound. I learned so much about myself and I learned, I, I mean, if I hadn't gone there, I wouldn't have truly understood the chaotic nature of the astronaut's life. It's insane. You know, it's kind of like being a touring musician. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds glamorous, but it's totally insane. And you have to just really, really want to be part of that in order to do it. So now my hope is, how can we make that more comfortable and pleasurable? And mm -hmm. how can we allow ourselves to thrive when we go through that um kind of exploration and not just you know not just survive to be, yeah i don't want us to survive i want us to thrive right. exactly. i love that i absolutely love that um well i i'm sure all of us have lots of questions so i just i just noted over guys if you have questions for mary liz please put them over in the chat i'd like to leave us a good 15 20 minutes here at the end for for your guys's questions um but mary Liz, one of the questions that ellen has she wants to know like what kind of things did you put in that time capsule uh that you left up there yeah i actually was just looking to see if i could share it with you um i don't have that ready but that's okay so basically it was just um i asked everybody for their intentions so it's it's this actually indestructible tiny tiny disk that um, all of this information was etched onto so it's all text and some imagery um, there was some artwork in there that was created by alan bean which was uh, one of our apollo astronauts an amazing artist um, but it was mostly like like some people told prayers it, they said little prayers for humanity for our species um, some people wrote poems about their vision for the future. Uh, but yeah, it was all just kind of stories, intentional stories about like what people wanted to see from our future. And I thought that would be a really cool thing for future beings, whether they're humanoids or who knows what, that comes upon this planet and someday digs that up and says, oh, wow, fascinating, an artifact from the past. What were they thinking, you know? I love that. I love that. Louise asks, um, how did meditation help you in such confined spaces? And how does meditation help you in general? Um, she's thinking about starting a meditation practice of her own. Oh, meditation has changed everything for me. And I have, I have like, um, in my life, I've always kind of like started and stopped. And um, I've always thought that I had ADHD, and I'm on the spectrum and, you know, all these things that made it I thought maybe had uh, made things a little more difficult for me and so um, it wasn't until maybe a year ago actually that a friend of mine gifted me his Buddhist meditation mm. and oh that has changed my life I had no idea 
And I started listening to Joseph Goldstein, which is this wonderful Buddhist Zen teacher. And he explains what you're doing when you meditate. And I was like, oh, thank God. Because like, I needed that. I, I really thought for a long time that meditation was about erasing thought, but you can't do that. So you're going to drive yourself insane. Um, I thought that daydreaming was bad. You know, like I just associated all of this kind of random information I'd heard about meditation and I, I associated it wrongly. Um, and so going through this meditative practice where I meditate 24 minutes every single morning, um, and I did that during my time at high seas and wow, was it necessary? Um, but it has, it has given me so much clarity on the different levels of noise that are always going on in my brain. And I realized that now I have dials, like I'm a musician, so I look at mixer boards and I see, you know, volume knobs on different channels. And now I can see, oh, wow. So here's shallow surface stuff. That's just going to be going on all the time because we're humans and our bodies just do stuff with, without us realizing it. So I can take that one and just kind of turn that dial down. All right, let's go deeper. What else am I hearing here? And it really helped me sort out and get into my, my innermost thoughts that are um, really telling me something um, and giving me new direction in life. And at, in, the, in the confinement of that habitat, um, at first it was so hard because I would wake up in the morning well before everyone else. I would start my meditation and all I could hear, like my heart was beating so fast. I think the elevation had a lot to do with my physiology. And mm -hmm. so it would be distracting. So then I thought, okay, well, just, let's just be present to that, you know? So really it's just about focusing on something like your breath in order to be present. Um, and you watch your thoughts go by, you know, it's not, um, it's not that you're trying to push them away. That's, you want to remain unrepelled. That's my favorite word <laughs> that I use when I unrepelled, but unattached. And you just kind of watch mm. things float, float by. Um, and it has really helped me gain a new kind of clarity that I've never had before and a new peace that I've never had before. Uh, so I can't recommend it enough. And it takes time it. and you have to learn self care and self compassion and not judge yourself while you're meditating. That's the hardest part mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I can't even get to breath two without, you know, having a movie play in my head. And then you say, yeah, that's okay. This is the whole point of the practice. Just come back to your breath. Just come back. It's all good. I and love it. Uh, yeah. Love it. Um, Linda says, sorry, now we're, we're in the rapid fire question section. Of I'm this. sorry. I'm so verbose. Um, <laughs> no, it's no, no, it's totally fine. That's why I left plenty of time at the end. I know that you always have great responses to all the questions. <laughs> um, Linda says, I love this notion of being, being consistently intentional. And I suspect that if uh, it would be helpful or inspiring for people to hear a bit more about your story of perseverance, um, mm -hmm. once you realized your calling, things didn't, things didn't come easy, but you persevered. Um, and then you wrote the article for us and, and everything broke open. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about this, this perseverance and this, you know, we talked a lot, you talked a lot about running into roadblocks, but being able to go through them. Yeah. And there is, Linda knows all of this because we've had such an incredible conversation on the podcast. Yes. Um, Everybody please yours. go listen to Mary Liz's podcast episode. I dive in pretty deep there, but, um, yeah, I think that I was not intentional for so long. You know, what happened was I grew up on a beautiful farm, just immersed in nature. I, I think about it every day. When I walk out in my garden here, I reconnect to those times and I realize that all my life I've just been trying to get back to that state of mm. curious wonder, you know. Um, but that was that was who I was. That was so, I was so happy. And then trauma struck at a very early age and it struck hard and then it continued to strike. And some of it, you know, in the beginning, it's like, well, you're a kiddo. There's like, there's nothing you can do about this stuff. Um, but at some point, you know, I got to a certain age and I didn't, I, yeah, the guidance, it, it was just, a, it was a tough time. All right. And so mm -hmm. 
um, I ended up dropping out of school. I ended up homeless for a couple of years, kind of like a couch surfing punk rock teenager, you know, angry at the world, very, very full of angst, anxiety. And so, of course, the trauma just built up from there because I was completely mm. un unintentional about everything. Um, I don't know how I made it through. There are times where I look back and I'm like, wow, I mean... I am lucky. In a lot of instances, mm -hmm. I'm very lucky. And that's why I have a lot of compassion for people who I see on the street or um, who just haven't somehow made their way out of that place because I recognize how hard it is. When mm -hmm. you have nobody throwing the rope down the barrel for you, mm -hmm. it's so hard to get up. And then, of course, if you get addicted to drugs, which I did, and have this dependency on chemicals that destroy your brain that destroy that you're not anymore who you actually are it is so hard to get out of there and so i do remember these like moments of clarity i would have out of i don't know if it was luck i don't know what but uh you know i'd look in the mirror and not recognize myself and that would mm -hmm. freak me out and i'd say you've got to do something and I would run away like that would happen mm. and all I knew how to do for a long time was to run away thankfully I would just be removing myself from terrible situations but it took a really long time for me it took me till my um probably mid-20s to really find um find a way for me to become intentional and what happened was all throughout that chaotic time I had always had this curiosity for uh, programming. I loved programming when I was a kid, like nine years old. We got a personal computer in the home, which was like the new thing for us anyway, uh, for someone who grew up on a farm. And I was obsessed. And so I had that, thankfully, installed at a young age, right, right when the trauma was hitting. So that was kind of my like, I would find solace in that. I, I didn't trust humans anymore. So I was like, all right, I'm going to program code into computer machine <laughs> and then so thankfully I had that always kind of in the back of my mind and I realized um at like 19 or 20 like I really need to pursue this full time mm. and and honestly it was at 16 homeless trying to figure out like do I really like do I really want to work three jobs at fast food restaurants and as a typist like for the rest of my life like trying just to find a way to pay to have an apartment for one month like no this is crazy and so I would go to the library and use their computers and check out books on programming and just feed that curiosity that I always had and thankfully by 19 I had gained enough knowledge to where I could actually go out with a resume of like programming knowledge and say please give me a chance I swear I want it so bad and someone finally gave me the job and um, lucky for me that's a really good industry to pick if you're going to pick one and so um, I found a way to find stability so I was no longer worried about the hierarchy of needs that was necessary from that point on I slowly gradually over <laughs> you know, 15 years, finally began to realize, you know, okay, the ground under me is actually becoming more stable. Anything could happen at any time. But the truth is, I think I can always pick myself back up. Yeah, I can pick myself back mm. up. Oh, yeah, I'm really strong. I can pick myself back up. And so then I started doing things far more intentionally. And I started to get inspired again. And then I began to be filled with wonder as I watched myself create this path of like this trajectory upward and like I love to reconnect with this story just because it shows me what's possible and now it's like oh my god where can I go from here this is amazing how can I help other people find that path it's just a matter of getting people to right there you know mm -hmm. and then they can they can do the rest so uh, that's incredible I, I think I want to pause there for that that incredible thought of if we can get people to right here, we can bring yeah. them up to that, the next exponential step. I, I, that's incredible. But I never thought of it that way, but that really is where I think so much of it, so much of what we're trying to do is get people to that step so they can find the, the full trajectory. Yes. Um, and I, I do yeah, see the ahead. next question. Yeah, do you mind? Yeah. We have time. No. Yeah. No, please, 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 please. 
Ellen asks this question, what do you think is the biggest impact on your life that the overview effect has made? Has it been your perspective on the world since being all this, being all in this together with our fellow humans or something else? So um, actually I was just having a, a follow-up thought while you were kind of pausing on that, um, Liesl, and I realized that this question perfectly ties in. It's that throughout my very difficult times, um, so I've seen extreme poverty and I have seen the other side of malevolence um, many times, many times. And so I know that it's it exists in the world. I'm not one of those um, optimists that will look away or, you know, gloss it over. I've seen it. I've stared at it in the face. And I know that it's it's happening to people all over the world every single day. And I'm not OK with it. <laughs> mm. And so what i realized at some point was somehow i i was just born with a lot of empathy and it's it makes things harder for me because i feel the pain of others and it's hard for me to move beyond that sometimes but what i realized was man i wish everybody could see what i could see it's kind of like what the ast i've never thought about this by the way i'm, ha I'm having a revelation the Maybe astronauts are always fun. like <laughs> The astronauts always say, God, I wish I could show everybody. I wish I could translate what I have, what I'm seeing, what I'm recognizing. And I, I felt that early on. I was like, man, I'm so empathetic. I wish I could gift this to other people because I feel what other people are feeling. And so I have this abundance of compassion and I'm always willing to talk to someone on the other side with compassion first and curiosity because I know that they know something I don't and and I know they're hurting in some way and there's a reason why you know there's discourse so let's the way to get through that is to be empathetic and to talk it out and and explore together um, without the walls of fear dividing us and and it was this idea that if only we could shift perspective and gift people empathy that's that's what I want. And so when I discovered the overview effect, literally Ron Guerin says everything that I just said in my last few words. He said when I was up there, you know, he was a fighter pilot, like, I mean, top gun, really into himself, fighter pilot, you know, in the wars, he'd seen great tragedy and been a part of it. He went up there and he said, oh, my God, I flew over. Uh, you know, the Middle East where I had fought and I realized suddenly I'm up here on the end of a robotic arm hovering over the planet in a spacesuit. Like I've got thousands of people all over the planet taking care of me, yet there are people down there with no water or mm -hmm. no clean water or no food or whatever, or war is going on and we're all part of this tiny little system. Like what are we even fighting about? That's what all the astronauts say. I see no borders what are we fighting about? And he said he instantly was gifted an elevated empathy. And it made him realize that if we could just show people the awe and wonder of our planet and our species and what we're capable of, then all of the walls of fear dissipate and we approach everything from a foundation of awe and wonder. And if we can approach things from a foundation of awe and wonder rather than fear, it opens up the mind to recognize that all these people that are different than us, all these people that have different ideas and opinions and what whatever, they also have missing pieces of the puzzle. And so we mm. have to approach them with curiosity and respect and compassion. And only then can we move forward together to make this planet and our species and wherever we go better than it was before. So... That was a long answer, but I think it is it is empathy, awe, and wonder that I always come uh, back to. I cannot think of a better way to just sum up the work that you do and the importance of the work that you are doing than, than those words. So I want to thank you so much, Mary Liz, for being a part of the Conspiracy of Goodness, for helping empathy and wonder and awe. Um, enter people's lives and um thank you for being with us this evening this has been so 
so looked forward to and it has been one of those times where I think our whole every, everybody kept saying they got chills every time you, you talked through this whole thing so mm -hmm. thank you so much Mary Liz for being with us this evening thank you guys so much I really appreciate everything you're doing as always and I can't wait to the next time I know I'm so excited I'm so excited um, mm -hmm. so everyone thank you so much for joining us this evening um, we are so glad to have you as a part of the conspiracy of goodness network um, we have two events like this every month we have our happiness hours at the top of every month and a workshop or master class midway through the month with one of our thought leaders um, these events are, are open and available to all of our Conspiracy of Goodness members, um, and they're a wonderful way to join in and meet uh, great thought leaders like Mary Liz. So Mary Liz, thank you so much for being a part of everything. I will link everybody uh, to your article as well as your podcast episode, as well as the work you do. Um, what is the best way as we sign off here for people to get in touch with your work and support your work? Oh. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, we have an amazing Discord community. If anybody's like really into space exploration and wants to follow along, I not only share the astronauts' perspective and my interviews there, but um, we're here, you know, documenting the forefront of space exploration. So if you're really wanting to nerd out, uh, come over to Discord. Uh, you can support our work on patreon.com slash cosmic perspective and that gets you into the discord community but otherwise if you just want to follow along i've got a book soon coming out that will be really meaningful a whole chapter on the overview effect with all of my uh, interviews with astronauts um that's that's coming out soon uh film and some other things but cosmicperspective.com is uh is the place where i'll be sharing all of that Love it. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Mary Liz. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Thank you all.